fight. Three, two, one. Welcome to Arcade Attack. <laughs> A retro gaming podcast for up to four players. Sonic Boom! Singing Sonky! Oh, you can! Welcome, listeners, to another Arcade Attack podcast. But I've given Adrian the week off, so it's still in here. Um, look, we're in our new studios. We've got new things. We're doing more video content. I know you guys on the audio and your stuff won't be able to see me, but everyone on YouTube, here I am. Hello. Um, so before I crack on with today's uh, interview, uh, I just wanted to give a shout out to our patrons. So this is StreamYard that I'm using right now. And this is all because of the guys who are back in, who are now back in the show. So, in no particular order, um, I'd like to give a shout out to Jake Rawlinson, Rich Pemberton, Andy Endine, R. Andy, uh, Arcade Attack, uh, Andy Smith. Okay, a lot of Andys. Um, Matt Harris, uh, Jeremy Rutz, uh, Tor Melkovic, uh, Stuart Munro, Shane Dowling, Dave Holloway, R. Tim Wilson. Okay, most of uh, Arcade Attack still sponsor most of our show. Uh, uh, Stewie, hello, mate. Um, Henrik, uh, Lada Vogad, hope, hope I've pronounced that right. Uh, James McDonald, Dave Hart, uh, Michael Needs, Charlie, also our Arcade Attack Charlie, uh, um, Michael Locke, and Rick Waldron. So thank all you guys. Um, you know, this kind of stuff is what you're paying for uh we could do some headsets and some other things and potentially to like improve our sound and stuff so you know if you're ever thinking of if you want to you know support the show then please patreon.com uh, forward slash arcade attack uh and then yeah check out the rewards and things and then hopefully we'll get you on board so this week uh anyone who knows me or anyone who's been paying attention to the podcast will know that i love video game magazines they are the thing that they kept me going uh, when I was younger. And there was one in particular, one in particular, uh, Sega Power. So our American viewers, listeners won't know much about it. But over here, it was, I think, the longest running Sega magazine. My guest will confirm that in a minute. Um, and it was the best. For me, it was the best. I look forward to it every day. Uh, I first bought it in 91, I think, on the Isle of Wight. Because I needed a pair of sunglasses, they repaired. They gave away free stuff on the front, and there was a, like Electronic Arts sunglasses. And I was like, "Oh, they're cool!" And uh, oh, there was like a big picture of the alien or something, or Predator or something on the front. I was like, oh, "Okay, I'll buy that." And then yeah, I was hooked from that moment on. I was hooked on that magazine. So it's my pleasure to introduce one of the editors of said magazine, Dean Mortlock, to the show. Welcome, Dean. Hello. How are you doing? <laughs> not too bad, so not too bad. This is a whole see see how I've just brought you in expertly. Yeah. This is professionalism. It's incredible. It's it's a whole level, a new level of professionalism. It's, it's, <laughs> well I'm glad. See, we have to we have to like, you know, our guests, we have to impress our guests first and then everyone else can come second. Well, I'm but, impressed, definitely. <laughs> but welcome to the show, Dean. Welcome Thank to you. the show. Um Sega Power. Mm. Amazing, amazing magazine. So how long did you actually work at the magazine? All, all, all in total, it's about six years. Wow. Um, yeah. Which is quite a while. Um, I started, uh, it had been about July, gosh, let me think, July uh, 1992. Wow. So it'd be, yeah, and it'd be 30 years next July. Um, that is I, happy anniversary for next year. And I stayed to the bitter end. I st- obviously, we relaunched at Saturn Power, and then yeah. we did 10 issues of that, and then obviously that was, it was no more. Nice. Um, so when were you actually the editor of Sega Power? So it was sort of towards, was it the mid-90s? Uh, uh, yeah, um, I'm trying to remember exactly when it was, really. It was, it was, it was towards the end of, the, of, the, of, the, of Sega Power's life. It was kind of at the point where everything was Saturn only, really. There was, there was mm-hmm. an awful lot of Mega Drive stuff coming through. So 
um, we kind of made the decision to, to change it to Saturn Powers because it and just focused purely on that. So I, I think I did. I think I did about three or four issues. I mean, somebody somebody could certainly prove me wrong because they, they they probably got a better memory of it than I have. But yeah, hmm. I, I did, we did a few, and then it kind of um, it was my goal really at the start. I thought, well, I want to relaunch the mag. I want to put a demo a demo disc on the front. Nice. Yeah. Um, and just kind of you know make a bit of a splash, and and, and obviously uh, yeah, that was that was the plan anyway. <laughs> that was the plan. Um, so Saturn Power, I think, lasted about ten or eleven yeah. episodes. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I'll come to the demise of the Saturn in a moment. But mm-hmm. so from that moment, so that moment yeah. when Saturn Power ended, and this moment now, where you're launching a new magazine. Mm-hmm. There you go, listeners. This is something for you to get your sink your teeth into. So you're coming back with Sega powered. So this yes. is going to be an all Sega retro new. Yeah. I've had a look at the preview. It looks fantastic. Okay. Why now? What what has led in the last sort of 20, 25 years, what has led you to this point? Blimey. So that's a really good question. I'm trying to think of a way to answer it. Sure. Um, I've stayed in publishing. I've, I've done uh, a lot of things since Sun Power closed. I worked in as freelance for a long time, working on, on a lot of games magazines. Um, mm. and, and thoroughly enjoyed that. Uh, to cut a long, probably quite boring story, quite short though. Basically, um, I got to know Paul Monaghan from Maximum Power mm-hmm. and I'm Mark Paul, yeah. from Sega Mags, yeah. both of whom have an incredible knowledge of everything Sega related. Mm. Um, I also got to, I got back in contact with uh, Neil Randall, who used to work on DC UK, um, and a few other Mags and Edge and other things like that. And also has an incredible gaming knowledge and is obsessed with Japanese shoot 'em ups and, and uh, Japanese RPGs. And those has an encyclopedic knowledge of all of them. Nice, um, useful. And it was also kind of spot. It was it was it was having a team together for starters. And I, I talked mm-hmm. to Paul for some time, probably two or three years now, mm-hmm. since because I, I was on his podcast as part of the Sega Power team, um, mm-hmm. probably about four years ago. And since then, um, we've kept in regular contact. And I've always said to him, you know, we should probably try and do a magazine. But it was getting the getting to the point when it actually all fitted together and then fitted into place. Um, he started working for a media addict, um, mm. and it was doing quite well. And we could see it was doing quite well. And I said, "Look, you know, clearly there is a market for independent mm. games magazines, and obviously Ninty Fresh was doing well, uh, Switch Player, and all those mm. other titles have been out." Um, and so we said, "Okay, well, let's give it a go. Let's just, just try it." And it kind of that was when it started. So it's kind of May, May this year, I guess. Sometime, some point in May. Wow! So it's only taken about five months to put together the first first preview. And when would the first yeah. issue actually be? I know you've got the Kickstarter running at the moment, but when you plan um, to have the first sort of issue proper out there? November. So we're going to keep it quite open ended. Right. In, it's sometime in in the month of November. It, wow! It's not like it's be early November. It's more like to be later. But um, we kind of thought, well, if the campaign is going well. Um, mm-hmm. Then obviously we can obviously see it's going to get funded, so we can start a little bit early. We don't have to wait until the campaign's over. Yeah. So um, clearly it's it's doing very well. It's only been on for twenty four hours, and it's it's we're kind of like seventy odd percent of the way there. That's amazing. That's really good. It's incredible, actually. To be honest, it's much better than I ever thought possible. <laughs> um, so we're, we've already started. We've done a lot of planning. We kind of know the features that are going in um, and we've got a kind of rough idea of the, the structure of the first issue um, and what's going on the cover and what the cover feature is going to be and other things that we've got in there. So it's just a case now of kind of, well, we were concentrating on the, on the Kickstarter initially for the first few days, certainly. Yeah. Because obviously a lot of people have comments, people want to know about it and people are putting up on groups saying, what's this, what's it all about. So we're making mm-hmm. sure we get to them as soon as we can, just to let them know. So, um, and then, so yeah, I guess imagine next week we'll be we'll be taking the first steps. That's the amazing. Question. That is amazing. I know. I know. I know. So that would be this. That will be th- when this is released. That that be this week. So yeah, there we go. So just in case people need uh, to get more perspective, um, but it's very exciting. You know, it's very exciting. Is it about trying to harness the kind of um, the feeling? of those mags so is the writing is it all kind of because you know i don't know if you meant um i think you might have mentioned it but sega mania mm-hmm. it's coming at the moment one thing i really like about that magazine is that the writing and the way they approach it it's slightly tongue-in-cheek yeah. you know it's like okay this is a review but you know we'll say what we want kind of thing yeah it, it, it's 
it's something I've given an incredible amount of thought into. I should probably wave more than I probably should have done. But again, it's it's difficult because when we were younger, in our 20s doing Sega to Power and all the other mags, I mean, the audience were in their teens. So yeah. a lot of them were casual gamers and you could be yeah. kind of flippant and silly and people loved it. Mm-hmm. Nowadays, it's slightly different because obviously the audience has grown up and the people that are mm-hmm. still in the Sega world and still collecting and still playing and still looking for magazines to buy, they're mm-hmm. a little bit more hardcore. They're not casual. They're they're dedicated they've been doing it for 30 mm. years they're, they're committed yeah so we'll be funny we'll you know we'll aim to kind of entertain as well as inform but um it, it, the idea it will be- is a bit of a problem trying to obviously trying to trying to find that balance because when mm. i first started reading sega power i was nine years old yeah and that writing and that you know the, the kind of what i think i think andy was the editor at the time what mm. that you know what that kind of meant to me and how easy it was to read, and how easy it was to pick up, mm. you know. How you know, and it was was that even your demographic? I mean, I suppose when you were setting out, you know, when you're starting out at Sega Power, did you think, oh well, you know, kids going to like primary school are going to be reading this, or you know, kids going to high school are going to be reading this? Or yeah, well, we had a pretty good idea because obviously Sega, we always work close. We've always worked closely with Sega on, on the mag, and, and they obviously told us because they knew exactly where their demographic was. They knew the, the, their audience and. Uh, the male female split pretty accurate and they knew the rough age groups of of the game, people that were playing the games because obviously people there were people that grew up with things like the spectrum and the, the, the computers mm-hmm. but having said that a lot of people were very new to gaming it was there was no loading there was no tapes it was just you, you mm-hmm. turned it on suck a kite and turned it on and off you off you went so yeah. there was that instant playability so that is immediate attraction to a lot of younger players yeah. Um, so yeah. we used to get obviously get a lot of calls and letters and stuff, and it was generally kind of yeah, it was younger, younger, sort of like say nine, nine upwards, nine, ten, twelve, that kind of age. Um, yeah. So you could be a bit silly, and they'll kind of find it funny, and you know, we couldn't, <laughs> yeah. but we couldn't, we couldn't be that. We couldn't have that kind of editorial tone now. It wouldn't. It just wouldn't work. That's the um, thing, isn't it? Yeah. So it's like yeah, it's trying to find that balance. But mm-hmm. so in in a standard issue of Sega powered. Yeah. Um, what are the kind of the features and things that anyone who wants to sign up to the Kickstarter? I, I saw one. I mean, the one that takes the one that appeals to me the most is probably the six month, the six month subscription, guys. You know, thirty quid. Come on, get on that. Uh, but in those six months, you know, in those issues, you know, what yeah. what can we expect to see? You know, in one of those. Well, um, we're going to keep it to very much a standard magazine format. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's going to have a new section. Um, there's still quite a lot of stuff going on uh, yeah. in the whole Sega world, aside from the fact, obviously, they are still producing games and they're still producing games mm-hmm. on a regular basis. We just had Super Monkey Ball out, mm-hmm. um, which we'll be covering in the first issue. Um, nice. And obviously, there's things like Intrepid Izzy, which is a fantastic, lovely little platform, which I'm sure you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so, obviously, there's not as so much as there used to be, but there is still there is still some new stuff. So, there'll be a new section, there'll be features. Um, there will be what we call the re-review section. Um, oh, yeah. Is, which is basically, we, we take a, the old games and we, we don't just do a kind of standard review. We say, say mm-hmm. okay, well, this game's however many years old. Mm-hmm. You know, imagine you're just picking it up fresh after so many years and you're putting it in and playing it. Does it still play right? You know, is it still mm-hmm. playable? Is it? You strip away the graphics, which obviously aren't up to modern day standards, but is mm-hmm. it still a game that you want to play again and again and again? Mm-hmm. And... One of my favourite Saturn games or Sega games of all time was Sega Rally. Yes. And I haven't played it for a few years, and I, and I loaded it up, and it's like, no, this is still as fantastic to play yeah. as it was 20-odd mm-hmm. years ago mm-hmm. because it, it because its core element is the gameplay, which has mm-hmm. remained obviously unchanged. Yeah. So that, we're going to be looking at that. We're going to be pulling it apart. We're going to be lots of box out. So there won't be hundreds and hundreds of words on, on, on the game because most people will already know exactly what it is. It's just a case of, mm-hmm. well, okay. And we'll do, every team member will do a review. Mm-hmm. So there'll be one main person who does a body copy, but each other other team members will do a small um just well I've played it again, just so people get an idea. There won't be an overall score, but each team member will do a score out of ten. So yeah. we kind of leave it like that really. Um we're gonna bring back the top one how Sega Power did towards the end of its life. Mm-hmm. Um so we're gonna suggest ten or twenty or we're gonna split up into the various categories. Um and just say these are these are games that I think you know you should, we think you should definitely play. Very good, it yeah. Good, yeah, it was a good thing with Sega Power because people used to read writing a lot. Used to say, "How can you dare put this game at number one?" It clearly must be <laughs> this game. It's like, mm, it's, it's, it's great. Your, you know, people are allowed to have opinions. You know, absolutely, absolutely. 
Um, so the features will be a mixture of kind of, uh, there'll be regular ones, which we'll do kind of every every month, mm. um, which will be kind of the same standard format, but just different copies. So it'll be things like, I don't know, guide to shmups or guide to first person games or guide to mm-hmm. this. And we'll, again, we'll pull them apart and do things like that. Um, we're going to do some interviews. Yes. Um, developer interviews and also sort of name, sort of well known names. We've got a really good one lined up for issue one. Can you tease any of them now? Are you allowed to say or not? Um, da, 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 da. Not. <laughs> well, um, I don't know actually. Um, I'll just I'll just say the person we're going to interview for the first issue currently has a Kickstarter campaign running at the moment as well for something oh, that okay. they work on, okay. um, which is which which is um, something that's very much in the spirit of the kind of games magazines of the day. And he's somebody who's very well known for doing a certain uh, televisual thing that was. Oh popular. yeah, well I think I, yeah I think our British listeners um, slash viewers might. It's, might it's, it's a very British thing, and um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, he's, he's, he's somebody I, I, I've known from the, the past. Um, yeah. He's a great character, he's a great writer, and he's a lot of fun. So it's, it's yeah. something that I'm looking forward to. I think to. I actually backed that Kickstarter. Yeah. <laughs> what you're talking about. You can't not really, because it's just such, <laughs> such a great idea. It's yeah, so it is. It is. It um, is. We, we won't say any more. We won't say any more. Hopefully, that's just tantalised people enough that they're just going to go and check it out now. Um, um, so we'll, we'll do some. We'll do some more light-hearted stuff. We'll do kind of. We're trying to do something a bit more fun, but we'll also do kind of something a bit more wordy. Yeah. Um, and just a kind of mixture, really. Um, I have to ask you. I know that yeah. sounds really. I have to ask you. In Sega Power, one thing I think I thought was hilarious was you had pictures of you guys like lying around sometimes, or just looking a bit zoned out, <laughs> and just a really sarcastic like description. I'd be like. Dean sitting on a sofa eating some popcorn or something, you know, something stupid like that. Are you guys going to bring that, bring that in? You know, Paul, Paul like straddled like on the floor or something, you know, something, something, not, something funny. We haven't really gone that far down the road yet to, to kind of really go into detail. Um, so, so possibly, yeah. I mean, it kind you've of, got to do it. yeah, you've got to do yeah, it. Yeah. The way it will probably imagine it will go is the first few issues, we'll try different things and see what people think. Yeah. So and if everyone says that's ridiculous, don't do that again, then we obviously will. <laughs> but if people think it's funny and they enjoy it, then obviously it'll become a regular thing. Because it is it is a difficult mag to get right, but we will yeah. get it right. But it might take a couple of issues to kind of get the tone exactly how we want it. But you know. Yeah. Well, it's in capable hands. I mean, you know, everyone's everyone's here who's involved with it. I think it's gonna be a great project. Uh, the link to the Kickstarter will be in the show notes or is in the show notes, guys. So yeah, please go check it out. Um, so yeah, Sega powered. That's yes. going to be great. Uh, Sega power. So yes. many, all those many moons ago, how did you even get started? I think it's got something to do with Andy Smith. I'm just, I'm, I'm trying yeah. to remember because I did do a little bit of research before, before the podcast, but how did you actually get involved with Sega power in the first place? Well, before Sega power, I worked, uh, for Paragon publishing, mm-hmm. um, who at that point were based in Trowbridge in Wiltshire. And, um, I was working before that. I was working in a pub, um, King Gamer, but not not necessarily any experience. Mm. And I walked into a job centre in Trowbridge, and I think as Andy did, I walked into that same job centre, not obviously a few years later. Yeah. And and it just said staff writer wanted for video games magazine. I thought, well, that's clearly a dream job that I'm never going to get. No. I'll go for it anyway. Yeah. And I went for it, and I got it, and it was um, working on the first two issues of Console Excess which was a mm. Sega t- a Sega and Nintendo Tips magazine. So it's doing yeah. massive guides and walkthroughs and, and maps and levels and everything like that. It's great fun. Mm. It's a good idea. Um, but they were moving to Bournemouth. I didn't want to move to Bournemouth. I wanted to stay in the area because my friends and family mm. were all in, in Wiltshire and Somerset. Mm. So I had a friend who worked at Future, and I said, if you hear of any jobs, um, can you let me know? Yeah. And he obviously saw Andy and, and, and heard that, you know, there was a job on Sega Power, and Andy Smith rang me in the office and said, would you be interested in coming in for an interview? And I did, and, and the rest, as I say, was, was history. Done. He said, yeah, it's it very straightforward. It was kind of, and I went to the interview with Andy, and we didn't, I don't think we, I think we spent about two minutes talking about the job, and then the rest of the time talking about, I know, pubs and nightclubs and everything else, just kind of, you know. It wasn't just Sega or Nintendo, it was like Duke's Head or Nag's Head, where, you know, where would you rather yeah. go? Yeah, yeah. All right, fair enough. Um, so, were you a Sega boy back in those days? I mean, when you were playing video games, I mean, what you know, you can, you can say now. I mean, it's been you know twenty five uh, no, no, years. Completely, you... no. 
Um, well, it, that, I had played them. I liked them, but I had an Amiga, so I was playing things on the Amiga. Ah, oh, good man. Yeah. Um, and so that was my machine of choice, and, and it was kind of a case of, well, I've got the Amiga, and I can play pretty much anything I want to play, so I, I was happy with that. Mm-hmm. But I could, I, people were, my friends around me were starting to get Mega Drives, and I was thinking, mm-hmm. and they clearly liked them, and the games were... It was just designed better for sort of arcade games and platformers and shoot 'em ups. And you thought, well, mm-hmm. that's kind of that's clearly where it's going to go. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I mean, when it went, you know, when it was uh, when I got the job, it's a case of taking the Mega Drive and my system home for the weekend and a big stack of games and getting up to speed playing sort of Desert, uh, Desert Strike and <sighs> Alex. It was, it was it literally was a dream job. It was it was unbelievable. I was like, I I can't believe I've got this job. It is literally the best job in the world. Wow, do you do you remember the the first couple of games you covered for Sega Power or was um, or S as it was known? But do you remember what what you covered? Uh, yeah, it was uh, New Zealand Story Mass Systems. The first oh, game I did. that's a good one. Great, it's a really good game. That is a really um, good game. Yeah, that was one of my favourites actually growing up. So I think the first issue I did was the Green Dog one. I think that's the first issue I did. So it, was, Dog, it was around yeah. the t- yeah, it was around the time of the, the, the when you mentioned the Alien one with the, the sunglasses. I think it was a couple after that. It was one or two after that, because it wasn't long after I started. Wow. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and, and it was kind of, I can't remember exactly, I can't remember exactly what it was after that. But it was, I think it was a Game Gear game. And in those days, we had a, a setup on the, um, for the Mega Drive and Mouse system where you connected mm-hmm. them up to the computer. You could do screen grabs yeah. on, the, on, the, on, the, on the Macs. Yeah. But not not the Game Gear. What you had to do was you had a, a box. You had you, you had it running through a TV. Connected they always the TV. look slightly overexposed. I was going to ask you actually. Yeah. That the screenshots always look slightly slightly lighter than than you would have liked. Well, it was literally taking a photo because you'd, you'd have it on the TV. You'd put, it's like one of those antique, you know, the cameras with it, but and you would literally put a hood over you as well. Oh my so god! You'd be sat there trying to play it. And then yeah. photograph it. It was, it was a nightmare, which is why they were the nineteen nineties or the nineteen hundreds. You know, you know. <laughs> yeah, pretty that much. sounds brilliant. I mean, that that just sounds like our dream. You know, big stack of games, take some consoles home. You know, yeah. You were living course, the dream. And of course, you get all the games released so that they will just turn up and yeah. you say you ring up the PR person, say, "Oh, you got so and so coming out." And you go, oh yeah, the review code's ready, and they send mm-hmm. it along. And you know, it, it was. Yeah, it was, it was, was it quite an exciting thing? I mean, obviously, you know, you know, you were covering these games, and then was you know, were there any sort of times that you were like really excited for a game mm. that you couldn't wait? You, you know, to wait to get your hands on. You know, what was what was the biggest actually of those? What were like the what was the biggest one that they gave you that they trusted you with? Well, Sonic Two was probably the biggest one. Wow, that obviously yeah. came out a few months after I I joined. Um, so that was obviously big, a big deal. Really. Yeah. Anything Sonic was always a big deal, and, and you had to be very. I had to go up to the offices and review it and 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 play it in the offices. Um, so they left me. Yeah. So I was in Sega's office uh, playing it. I could, I could stay as long as I wanted to. I stayed there all day playing it. Um, but it, it, we couldn't take the code away. There wasn't enough code to, to give out to people, so yeah. it was a case of having to in the office. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, fundamentally. Um, Especially more so in those days, I think certainly gamers were hired to work on the magazines rather than mm. uh, journalists. Yeah. So people were hired because they had experience and a passion for games. And of course, if you have a passion for games, that just comes through in the copy. And, and you can clearly mm-hmm. tell when somebody's just doing it because it's a job or when they're doing yeah. it because they really love the, the medium. So, you know, so, you know, somebody from Mega would come down and say, oh, we've got this code. And, and you'll sit around the screen and, and whack it in. And you'll sit again and get really excited about the new stuff. And mm-hmm. at lunch times, we'll play EA Hockey and Madden, and you know. And, and then it evolved to sort of Pro Evo Soccer and everything like that over the years. And, yeah. But you'd walk through the future offices um, when kind of um, PlayStation Two era, and, and on every uh, every magazine uh, TV, there was be Pro and Evo being played at lunch times. So it was just, oh, it was just that's a great success game. with it. Oh yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it, it was. You never cut. Sometimes. The, job it was hard work sometimes you got a bit fed up with it but you never lost the passion for the actual subject it was always kind of because there's there always something new coming up that was worth talking about or interesting mm-hmm. that people you knew that people would want to see and you would always yeah. battle for the exclusives for you know the, the other mags and um you'd always get the other issues and me machines and things like oh, they got that game I mean, really, you, know, you get was there i mean there was always a, there was always a perceived rivalry with those magazines growing up you know you'd have right. like Little barbs by you know me Vashid Sager and you're like what was there you know obviously you wouldn't have gone to the same kind of shindigs and things was there a bit of rivalry did you want to get you know well you know 
run up on those guys? Was it was it that important, or you just were, you know, sticking to just sort of getting getting what you needed off your desk? Um, no, not really. I mean, it was on a professional level. You might have a little dig at each other in the magazines, but you know, we we did we used to meet up at these events, and you know, you'd, you'd have a chat about anything else. You know, just it, it, it's never. It was, I never saw any of it anyway. It was always kind of very friendly because you're all kind yeah. of in the same boat, really. Aren't you? So you're kind of doing the same thing. Well, this is the thing, isn't it? Like we we kind of started out thinking, well, you know, we've got to be this and this that, and the other. But it actually helps that we all cover this kind of same thing, and we all share the same listeners, the share, you know, the same viewers, and everyone. So we can, you know, we all do different bits of retro gaming, and we, I think, we all kind of complement each other quite well. So you've got people like the Retro Hour and Maximum Power Up do more like interview type things, and we'll just sit around having a beer talking rubbish about Sonic and, you know, that's our thing. And that's, you know, that's where we kind of sit in this whole thing. But with, with the magazines, someone, you know, sometimes I could only afford like one, one or two mags. So mm-hmm. I'd always get Sega Power. And then if my local news agent had run out, I'd maybe go Mean Machine Sega or mm-hmm. Sega Pro. But, you know, Sega Power was always the one I looked to get. Oh. But so, I'm, you know, I'm, you know, you guys should have had a bit of a rivalry. Really? Because you know you're fighting over my pocket money. At the end of the day. <laughs> Literally, yeah. We're, we're walking behind you with you know trying to grab your pockets. <laughs> I mean, it was the sunglasses that that wrote me in. I think um, I saw on uh, Keith, one of our one of our lot, sent me a picture as soon as I said I was going to chat to you. He sent me a picture of uh, a page of the Sega Power uh, Annual. I think it was must must have been ninety three, ninety two, ninety three, and it mentions that you're the editor of some one of the so the add-on books and oh, things yeah. that go with the Sega. That, is that how you got into editing at Sega Power? Did you? I've forgotten what book it was precisely. To be honest with you, um, but you were editor of that supplement. We did, we did a couple. We did the um, uh, we did a really groovy tips book. We did the and there was another. It was a yeah, I remember that one. Yeah, um, and then then we, we there was supplements and stuff. Um, it it was it was it was it was it was usually obviously when when you work on a mag it's it's a natural progression it's up to editor, mm-hmm. um, and it wasn't long after being on the magazine that I thought that's what I want to do I want to be the yeah. editor I want that's the job I want I didn't want to be a publisher or anything like that I just wanted yeah, to yeah. be an editor I wanted to have the control of the mag I wanted to be able to, I just wanted that you know to be able to have a, a, a real input into the way it was it was going. So I just I just kind of worked up towards it really, and, and you yeah. know things would come up, and like I say, literally, it was a case of supplements would come up, and we'd go, "Well, can I leave that with you?" And you'd go, "Yeah, and you can." You planned it all out like a mini map, really. So mm-hmm. eventually, they think, "Well, okay, you did an okay job with that." Then we'll give you a bit more responsibility, and you know, eventually, you end up in the, in the yeah. hot seat. Were they quite Were they quite nice about that? Obviously, you had the Andes that that edited the the mag. Were they quite, you know, go on then, Dean, you can go and do it, or were they a bit like, "Whoa." Oh, he's trying to steal my job. He is. You know what's going on there? <laughs> no, they, they, we all got them really well. Actually, I think obviously there was one, two. I think I worked under four editors on Save the Power, um, and you know you, we got them really well with all of them. I went, I went on holiday with Mark Ramshaw and, and Jason McAvoy on, on Save the Power. We all went off together for a week. Nice. So you know we were, we were all kind of mates, and you know we'd hang out in the pub afterwards, and you know, and, and that was it. You know, you, you spend all day together. You, you kind of get to. You know, either like somebody or dislike them, but generally we were really lucky. We had a good team. You kind of, you kind of grow to stand up, you know, to, to kind of put up with them, don't you? Like Andy's like, oh yeah, Dean's all right, yeah, all right. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, stick him on the roof rack. Um, but... oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I was just going to say, I saw Andy um, last year actually. It might, it might have been the year before or two years ago. But I haven't seen Andy for years, Andy Smith, mm. and um, it was Sammy's birthday, so we all met up in a pub in Bath. And it was great to see him actually. He's, he's doing really well. I'm glad it was actually when editing his work. So when um, I think I think I kind of stalked him on Facebook because Paul was friends with him on there. He kind of came. I was like Andy Smith, Andy Smith. Oh, that's the Andy Smith. And I just dropped him a message and said, "Well, you know, as a fan of Sega Power, and actually editing his interview was odd because I'd you know gone through all of those years reading all of that stuff that he'd edited. And I'm there actually sat sort of editing his kind of copy. It was yeah. It was very odd, but very cool. But yeah, so this is another reason why I love Arcade Attack. And I, I did promise before the, the interview I'd tell you how Arcade Attack came about. So yeah. Arcade Attack wouldn't exist if it wasn't for Sega Power. And the reason being, and an old, um, the guys who listen to the show will know this from, from years ago, was that uh, about, must be about seven years ago, I put together all of my Sega magazines, mostly Sega Power, 
mostly pristine, put them all together. And I was like, oh, you know, I could get about five or 10 quid for these each. So I put them on a pile. I was living with my parents at the time. And uh, and then the next morning, I can kind of hear some shuffling around and I wake up and they're kind of gone. And then I said to my mum, mum, where are my Sega mags? And she goes, wasn't that recycling? And I was like, no, that wasn't recycling. The magazine's worth a lot of money. The shuffling and everything was my mum getting them out the door before the recycling guys came. So by the time they got down, they were gone. And we're looking at probably about, I must have had about three years worth, maybe 30, 40 mags, all gone. Just like that in the blink of an eye. And then it was just kind of, that kind of like really hit home. And I thought, wow, that writing... And, you know, what those guys were trying to get across, you know, I'd love to do that in a blog. I'd love to do my own website, do that in a blog. I started off as Dylan's Arcade and then it became Arcade Attack. And then Adrian kept nagging me to do interviews. And then here we are. So we did the podcast. Here we are. So and here we are talking. So thank you. You should be being a great it's a great podcast, you. so you should be really proud of it. I think all of no, it. thank you, thank you. I think that the um, the ten people who listen to us love it, so that's it. Just for those guys, for those Patreon guys, that's it. Those, those are the guys who listen to us. Um, but yeah, Sega Power, great. You know, I think if anyone can pick up a copy on eBay, or anything, yeah, again, go pick up a copy of that. Uh, so Saturn Power, yes, Saturn Power, Saturn Power, the mm. ill-fated Saturn Power. Mm. Um, was that? I mean, the curtailing of that. I mean, it was only ten, eleven uh, um, issues long. Was the curtailing of that because of the demise of the Saturn, or was there something? Was it something else that, that you know the plug got pulled? Uh, purely that, really. I mean, it, it's because I, I pitched. I said, well, "Look, we should rebrand the Saturn Power. We should redesign the mag, mm-hmm. and go with a, 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 a demo disc." Mm-hmm. And, and I suggested that because at that point, the third-party software lineup was still pretty strong. So mm-hmm. I contacted all the third-party because you couldn't get anything first-party or, or very little. Yeah. So you have to go third-party. So I contacted them and I had a whole list. And I said to the publishers, look, we've got 10 discs booked in. We've said, these yeah. people said we can have this one. We had, we had the fir- almost the first year already to go. We wow. confirmed. They said, yeah, you can have that. You can have that game on that slot. Yeah. Um, so they were like, yeah, okay. So a bit of a no-brainer. So we did the first one. And the, the, the demise of the Saturn's third-party development was so quick mm. that it was, it, they were dropping off almost daily, certainly weekly. Wow. Um, so the games that we had booked in, so we had the first one, um, well, the first two, we had those booked in, they did Gremlin one and the other one I can't remember. Oh, no, Pandemonium, wasn't it? Mm. So we had those those two, were, were, were good to go. The, the one that was on issue three dropped out. I can't remember which one it was, unfortunately. Wow. Um, but So we did a, a, a music CD, um, and, then, and then we had, obviously, Wipeout, which was quite a good one. Yeah. Um, and then that was it. That was it. That was the last one because it was, you know, it just dried up all, 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 almost overnight. That is just, it's just mad. I think we, it's, I love it. I mean, the Saturn, I do love it mm. now. But back in those days, I had a PS1. I had, I had a PS, I had a PlayStation. Mm. And I remember we were, I was around Keith's house and we were playing FIFA 98. So FIFA Road to World Cup 98. Yeah. And I remember telling him, I'm like, why does the net not move? So when you score a goal, the Saturn or the, that version of it, it was just completely rigid. Whereas like the PlayStation, you're like when the ball hits the back of the net, it kind of waves and that. And I was like, what is up with that? And then ever since then, it just got, you know, for me and then our little click, key to stay true to it, to be fair. But all of us were just, you know, PlayStation boys. And then, you know, um, some couple of us got the Dreamcast and then PS2. But, you know, what did you think of the Saturn when, when it first came on your desk and when you realised that you had to change direction and kind of, you know, follow it? What, what did you think of it and why was it, you know, why, why was it so dwarfed, do you think, by the, by the PlayStation? Well, they, they, they missed just the market in the sense that they were carrying on down the 2D route and Sony were obviously going, no, it's 3D. And here's the mm-hmm. machine that can do that and do it very well. So it's sort of a bit of a last minute kind of, oh, crap, we better, we better boost it up a bit. Which is mm. why, as you know, the Saturn is a fantastic 2D machine. If you want mm-hmm. to play a shoot 'em up or you want to play a beat 'em up, it, it, there's nothing to touch it. It's just mm-hmm. on 3D, it can get a bit clunky. Um, but then having said, and also it was, a, it was a nightmare to develop for. Every developer I ever spoke to said it's it's absolute hell. It's, it's an absolute nightmare to, to work on. And Sega mm-hmm. were quite 
careful about what, what development tools they release to third party developers. They collect yeah. some of the best stuff in themselves, which I kind of get, but equally it meant that the third party stuff never kind of reached its full potential. Mm-hmm. But then you see a game like Sega Rally and you play things like Sega Rally and Virtual Fighter 2 mm-hmm. and Fighters Mega Mix. And mm-hmm. you go, well, that, this is what it can do. This is yeah. when, you, when you've got the team writing behind it. Mm-hmm. These are the sort of games it can make. And they are great games. They're mm-hmm. absolutely brilliant games. Um, so it was a real shame. But I, I just think, and also things like 32X and Meg CD, I mean, they had limited popularity in some areas, but I think the problem was that 32X especially, I think people thought they, they, they lost a little bit of trust with Sega. They were like, well, yeah. we're not quite sure about this. Yeah. Uh, and, and unfortunately, Sony had the marketing. They had, they had the, the, the yeah. Players, and they had things like Wipeout and they were playing yeah. the PlayStations in nightclubs. And whereas Sega before made Sonic, made the Mega Drive and the Genesis cool. Um, yeah. And Sony then took their lead and, and made the PlayStation 1 the, the cool machine to have. Yeah. Um, whereas I think in some ways Saturn was a superior machine. And, and mm-hmm. you know, I, I would, I play more Saturn games now than I do, certainly do PlayStation ones or PlayStation 1 or 2 ones. Yeah. Because the games that I like to play are, are, are Saturn only. So. Yeah. Yeah, no, I love it now. But again, mm. at the time, I missed I missed all of the two D games. You know, mm. we're too busy focusing on sort of the the shortfalls uh, of the of the three D games to really appreciate the Saturn for what it was. You know, and yeah. uh, so things like uh, like Layer Section and Raiden mm. Silver Gun and good too good too like two D shmups, obviously with layers and things should have got that kind of exposure over here, but they didn't. So it was just always like comparing, like, oh, the PlayStation is better at three D, and and that was that really. But I love it. I love the Saturn. Yeah. And then I love the Dreamcast after. Do you reckon you would have started a Dreamcast Power? Do you think if that if the Saturn Power was still going, you would have still done? You would have done a Dreamcast Power. I guess so. I guess so. But I think I I, I was a real fan of DC UK. And I'm, not, I'm just saying that because Neil's obviously. Yeah. I, I always like. <laughs> I, I yeah. No, yeah. It was a brilliant Mac. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. But I like I like the size of it. I like the look of it. And I like the design, mm. and um, so I, I kind of thought, well, I don't know whether we would have done anything quite as good as that anyway. So I think you know they they did the right thing, and, they, and it worked obviously for a while. Um, you know, sometimes I'd have enough pocket money to buy two mags, mate. You know, you could have bought you know DC UK. You could have had you could have had uh, Dreamcast Power. It would have worked. You know, that's true. That's true. That's true. Um, but um, I think I think what. Just briefly go back to Saturn before I bore you mm. completely rigid. I think what, what's interesting now is that a lot of the hardcore gamers, the people that are stuck with it, they're the ones that are playing the Saturn games mm-hmm. rather than playing the PlayStation games because the games with the longevity, the ones that are the most interesting and playable, are on Saturn. So that's why, like you say, the, the shooter much you mentioned are still yeah. being played now. Mm-hmm. Um, or Sega Rally is still being played now and things like yeah. that. Um, I was talking to the guy, I don't, do you know Overjump, the guy who's doing the PC version of Sega Rally? No. <laughs> um, you, have to, you have to check okay. that out on, um, on Twitter. I, I was talking to him earlier on. Yeah. And he's basically recreating the first stage of Sega Rally in, in you know, the latest whatever Wow, it is, okay. PC. And it looks it looks staggering. I'm listening. Okay. But yeah, find it on Twitter because it really is worth it. There's no videos, but it's just kind of working on still images at the moment, and, and it looks yeah. astonishingly good. And you can't imagine necessarily doing that with something like Ridge Race or anything like that. It's because it's – I'm mean, somebody may have done it already. I, I don't, can't say that. But um, it's the same right. It, it would home. just look like – yeah, it would just look like Tokyo, I guess. Would it? <laughs> just like, oh, look, you're driving around Tokyo. Yeah. yeah. No. But, yeah, I'd love to see that. Okay, right. I'll get – I'll get you the details of that. Let me check it out because it is really, yeah. and it's an he, he posts regularly, and he's kind of hoping to get it sort of finished by the end of the year. Yeah. It's a, like I said, it's a PC thing, so um, yeah, be, I can't wait to see that running. It's going to look staggering. Isn't it? Get it on there. Get it on there. So, okay, you mentioned the bird. I'm glad you mentioned them actually. What did you first think of the Mega CD when it first, when when it came in the door? When they said, "All right, Dean, well, Sega have got a new gizmo." <laughs> It's going to give you a bit more memory, but it's still 16-bit. Have a go! Have a go at this. Well, I, I remember liking it because it was kind of the whole FMV thing. Mm-hmm. You, had, you had the mode seven effect. That mode seven style thing was kind of in. Yeah. The, but also, you had the FMV, and I remember thinking, okay, well, this could really open things up a bit. This could make games, you know, a bit interesting. It could, it could mm-hmm. be the next stage, really. And some of them work quite well. And um, mm-hmm. I remember playing Night Trap and thinking. Oh, yeah. 
But um, did you ever complete it? Do you ever get to the end, or was it just too much for you? Do you know what I did? I did because I I I was lucky enough to go over to America to speak to the guys who digital pictures, the guys who made it, and yeah. focus on some of the the following up follow up games. So um, I kind of made sure that I had completed it just in case. Um, but it was, um, you know, we, we, we were optimistic because we were obviously we were fundamentally gamers at heart. It was kind of interesting and it was something that you think, well, at least, you know, say you're trying this, you know, they're trying to do something new. Um, and some of the games look good and some of the games are quite interesting. So we thought, OK, we, 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 we got behind it. We were quite yeah. enthusiastic. 32X. The 32X, yeah. What was that? Yeah. I like that as well, actually. Going back through the 32X catalogue has been a joy. So, but again, at the time, it just seemed a bit of a rip, really, how much it was. And obviously, towards the, the, the late, the later in its life, you could have got it for tuppence. But yeah. I wish I bought them all up. <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of money now. Yeah. Um, yeah. We kind of, again, we started off optimistically, and there were some good launch titles with it. Mm-hmm. But again, we after, it wasn't long before we started thinking, "Oh, this isn't going to, this isn't going to work. Really. This isn't going to ride. This isn't, isn't going to be a sustainable thing for long." Um, so you knew that. So as soon as it sort of came in, the whole yeah. team at the Sega Power knew that. Yeah, Sega were clutching its straws a little bit. Well, again, you can think. Well, it's it's, it's rather than focusing on on the next generation, it's it's trying to boost up the the, the current one. Mm-hmm. Whereas, obviously, rather than doing that, they should have been plowing everything into the sand. Mm-hmm. Um, but now, again, we, we kind of thought, I think so, it's okay. Well, it, you know, initially, we thought, this, this could be interesting. And it, but like I said, it, it, it clearly, it quickly became apparent that, it, you know, it wasn't going to, it was just a stopgap. And it, I, I think there was, I can't remember what the, the time frame was between the 30 steps being launched and the Saturn coming out in Japan, but it was, it was quite mm-hmm. short, wasn't it? It was quite a painfully short amount of time. Yeah, it was, yeah. Yeah, I think um, it was like months, yeah. So people are like, well, I'm not going to buy that because I'm going to buy that. So <laughs> <laughs> obviously, yeah. it was. Do you, do you think Sega? Do you think Sega were a little bit too ahead of their time? I mean, you've got that. I mean, you've got the. You know, they were one of the first ones to get um, sort of CD storage for games. You've got, you know, the 32. They were 32 bit pretty much. Mm-hmm. They had the Sega Channel. They had the Dreamcast. Had um, internet capabilities. Do, do you think they were just a little too ahead of their time? To be, you know, to be successful as well, they are a software company now, and obviously that's what they're focusing on. But do you think they're a bit ahead of their time as a hardware company? That's a good question. Um, I don't know really. I, I, I did they always I, allow you? So whenever the, something came about, you know, obviously you had the, the Sega and Nintendo news, but did the Sega news always wow you as a, you know, as opposed to the Nintendo news? Well, obviously they had the arcades, so there was that kind of thing mm-hmm. of if you if you saw a game coming out in, in the arcades through Sega, the, the, the reality was that you knew that at some point in eighteen months' time we were really playing it at home and, and very often a decent conversion. So that was always they always had that angle to fall back on, and they always had that mm-hmm. the arcade heritage, yeah, which obviously helped a lot. And and you always got the feeling Sega were kind of you know they they, they knew about games and they knew what they were doing. Mm-hmm. Um, possibly more than the hardware, I don't know. But um, but the Dreamcast was a fantastic machine. I was never quite understood why that didn't do better than it did because it it answered so many of the questions, the problems with the mm-hmm. Saturn. You know, it was easy to develop. It looked yep. fantastic. It was online. It was actual was arcade quality, and I think mm-hmm. yeah, it was. Uh, some of the games were even better on it than in the arcades. So something like Soul Calibur mm-hmm. was better on the DC than it than it was in the arcade. So. Yeah. I know. If they had it. They had basically the arcade in your home, but it only sold nine million units. Crazy. Well, Crazy. It is, yeah, it is such a bizarre thing. Uh you know, do you, I don't I don't suppose this question has ever come across, but you know, uh, across, across your thoughts. But do you wish that Sega was still making hardware? Do you wish that there were uh Xbox, um PlayStation, Nintendo and Sega still there? Or do you think they're sort of best consigned to the to the nineties? No, I, I kind of wish they were. Really, to be honest, I think I think I think by now with their experience, they kind of would have given us something a bit kind of interesting. Hmm. I admire Nintendo the way they release their machines because you never quite know what you're going to get, and it's usually quite uh, original and impressive. And things like mm-hmm. the Wii, and although the Wii U didn't do incredibly well. It was original and it was it was trying different things, and of course, as we know, the Switch is is a phenomenal piece of kit. It's a great little machine. 
Mm-hmm. So I admire them because while in some ways this, the, the Xboxes and the, and the PlayStations are quite traditional games machines, Nintendo are always the ones that are kind of doing things a little bit differently, and I like that. I think Sega would probably fit, fit in a nice little gap somewhere in between the two, I think. I don't know if they had carried on producing hardware. Did you ever think in the 90s that you'd be playing Sega games on a Nintendo console? Uh, no. no. <laughs> it was, it was, I think Mark described it as, as being a cold day in hell when and someone <laughs> came, to, came to Nintendo. It is just, it's the weirdest thing, isn't it? It is the, it is the, the, the strangest, strangest thing. But that's where Sega are now. And I think it, they do, you know, there's a nice bit of chunk of, you know, games and things that you guys can cover for Sega Powered. And, you know, really looking forward to, to you guys covering all of that. Uh, what makes, why do you think we're still talking about Sega, 90 Sega, 25 years ago? What was sort of special about, what makes Sega special for you? Why, you know, why, why have you now gone back into the the pit, the bear pit, as it were, <laughs> of um, Sega Mags? You know, um, well, Sega Powered is Sega Powered, obviously, because of the team, because three of us are very in, ingrained in the Sega universe. Neil and myself and Mark. Mm-hmm. I mean, um, so it kind of had to be Sega. It couldn't be anything else. But uh, I think it's the games, really. It's just, it's just that what we were saying before about the kind of last ability and the playability of them, in the sense that they're still enjoyable mm-hmm. uh, decades after they were released. And I, yeah. I don't know whether we'll be saying that. With, we certainly, I don't think we're saying that with a lot of, the sort of early PlayStation releases. I don't think mm-hmm. I have that interest and in, in kind of desire to play them. But um, things like, well, Sonic, obviously. I mean, um, I'm not the biggest Sonic fan in the world. I like mm-hmm. Sonic. I <laughs> like it, but. I, there's other games I prefer more, but I, but having said that, I loaded it up and I haven't played Sonic One in a long, long time. And what struck me immediately was just how good it still is, how playable mm-hmm. it is, um, how good it still looks. The graphics yeah. have a very unique style; and it's fast as anything. Um, and you just didn't have games like that on Nintendo, not very many anyway. And no. it's it's mm-hmm. um, I think that's kind of why we are really. It's it's just because of the just because of the amount of the sheer volume of, of quality titles. That's so good. Did you ever play any of the later Sonics? When when did you stop playing Sonic? Have you stopped playing Sonic? Do you have you, have you played every single one since since Sonic? Um, I kind of stopped. I, I, I played Sonic Adventure. And I like Sonic Adventure. I mm-hmm. kind of it slowly kind of dried up, dried up a little bit after that. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Sonic Mania is a very good game. I think that's that's oh, yeah. that's just clearly a love letter to the to the to the. Um, to the heritage of the yeah, character and, and the developers, and I love the fact that you kind of play through level and, and as a boss stage, you have a game of Mean Bean Machine. I thought well, that's just such yeah. a nice touch. It just yeah. really works really well. Um, so I've really enjoyed playing that, um, and I think Sonic 2D is kind of where it works best. I think Sonic 3D, mm-hmm. a lot of the time, it just doesn't, it just doesn't work. I remember picking up one of them, and I can't remember which one it was. But I kind of started a level. It was, it was literally playing on one of the games machines at Future Publishing, and I picked up mm-hmm. a controller. I said, well, have a go. And I remember pushing forward on the controller at the start of the level, and I don't think I did anything until it got to the end. I'm not going to just slightly left and right. I didn't have to press any buttons. It just hit speed ramp up the speed ramp. And I thought, well, that's to me, that's not that's a proper game. It's just a yeah. Mm. Um, but the earlier Sonics, um, it did what they, they were designed to do, which was create a character that was cool, um, and marketable for Sega, but at the same time, it, it was a hugely playable game. Which mm-hmm. you know, you, you talk to Neil uh, on the magazine. I mean, I, it was just literally one of the first times we kind of talked about the mag. I said, mm-hmm. "What is it for you that you love about Sonic?" And he went into this long story, which is lovely, about why Sonic is quite is so special to him, and he really loves mm-hmm. the games. And I thought, okay, well, like, that's I get it, I understand it because he has that love and he grew up with it, and it's 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 a character he's he's sort of at the start of gaming. That's what he, he grew up on. Mm-hmm. So um, that's probably a very long answer to uh, probably was a very short question. <laughs> no, <laughs> perfect. That's perfect. That's <laughs> Sorry about that. that. That's exactly what we think about him. And then, you know, so- Sonic is a big part of us. Mm-hmm. We've got a Sonic episode as another little teaser for our listeners, our viewers. We've got a little Sonic tribute uh, podcast coming up in the next couple of weeks. So he turned thirty, and we completely missed mm-hmm. it. I think we were still on hiatus, <laughs> so we were just yeah. like, oh, oh, did Sonic turn thirty? Okay, all right, we missed that. Okay, we'll do something. We'll do something later in the year. So we have done. So yeah, yeah, 
we do. We're going to we're going to do something for the first issue because obviously, again, we missed we missed the anniversary, mm-hmm. and yeah. you can't you can't let thirtieth anniversary go by without some mentioning what they say. We'll no, you know, life life ends at thirty, doesn't it? Is that what they say? So we hope not, because I'm twenty odd <laughs> years past that. Then. <laughs> Oh, same, same, same. But you know, I wonder if we'll, in in twenty years' time we'll still be you know sitting around chatting about Sonic, probably. I hope probably. so. I hope so. I think the, the problem is when you get to the age where your reflexes start to go and you can't quite do it as well as you used to. <laughs> That's danger. Um, and I can still get a decent time on 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 the desert track on on Sega Rally, so I'm quite happy with that. So I'm oh, still nice. there. But um, nice, yeah, love a yeah. bit of the desert. Yeah, love the desert track. Yeah, it's such a good game. It is such a good game. Um, but yeah, you know, Deep, it's been great chatting to you. It's been slightly surreal, obviously. You know, you're you're responsible for a large chunk of my of my growing up. But you know, it's been it's been really good chatting. We do ask all of our interviewees one question, now, so as you would have cottoned on in some of the other ones before before you go. If you were to have a drink or go out for drinks with any video game character, who would you choose and why? I should have prepped you for this before. I didn't realise. You should have. As, as soon as you said that, as soon as you said the question, I thought, oh, yes, I have heard that before. I just didn't, <laughs> didn't need to prep it. Um, oh, my gosh. If, if, on any format? Any format, so any video game character, who would you go? I mean, it might not necessarily be um, the funnest night out. Maybe if you wanted to know something about someone or, you know, uh, predictably, a lot of our interviewees have said Lara Croft. I mean, um, I probably would as well, you know, hands up, hands up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Sonic would be fun, but he'd be too busy talking about himself. I'm like, come on, mate, you know. The one that, the one that pops into my head, and I, I have no idea why, is Duke Nukem. Duke Nukem, okay, yeah. Because yeah. it would be an odd night. It would be quite an experience. I think you might feel a bit weird the next day. You, you, you might have sore head and a few limbs missing, but I don't think it would be an evening you'd forget. We do know. I think. I think we've interviewed John St. John, who does the. Um, who did the Have voice you? room? So we've got his email address somewhere. We can hook you guys up. Oh, you guys, we can make that happen. We can make that happen. You going out with you, Nukem? Did so. you get? Did you get to do some sound clips for you? Yeah. <laughs> oh no, oh, they'd love it. They would love it. They'd love it. Um, but no, thank you very much, Dean. You're a great pleasure. answer. Um, good luck with Sega Powers. Thank you. Like I said to all our our viewers, our listeners. Please check the notes. Go and back it. Back it now. Make sure they get past that that goal. Um, Dean, was there anything else you'd like to tell our viewers, our listeners before you before you before you go today? Uh, gosh, um, no. I mean, obviously, go to the Kickstarter page. Have a look through. We put a lot of information up there for you. Yeah. Um, in the actual read the comments, we've got the dummy issue, which is a digital dummy issue, which we put, again put a lot of time in. The social um, media, so it's at at Sega Powered. Yeah. I think is it yeah, on Sega Twitter? Power, yeah. we're on Twitter and um, Facebook. Um, and we're all on there, you know, Mark and myself mostly, I think, and Paul went, you know, as well. We're always, there's always somebody lurking around. So if you need to know anything, if you want to know anything about the mag or anything at all, please just drop us a line and we'll get back to you very soon. Perfect. Thank you very much, Dean. No Thank you very much, listeners. Thank you very much, viewers. I hope you've enjoyed our slightly new format. Uh, We'll get Adrian back next week. Don't worry. This will be a one-off from me. But, um, yeah, from me, from Dean, good night. Thank you. Good night. Thanks for listening to today's podcast. We really hope you enjoyed it. You can tweet us at Arcade Attack UK. We're also on Facebook at facebook.com slash Arcade Attack UK. Check out our website at arcadeattack.co.uk for lots more retro gaming goodness and to delve into our archives. Our podcasts are also available on Spotify, Stitcher, Podbean, YouTube and Apple Podcasts. Please leave us a review and a rating, we'd really appreciate it. If you'd like to support Arcade Attack, please check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash arcadeattack, which will give you access to exclusive podcasts, interviews and other bonus content. So, until next time, take care and we'll speak to you soon.